Peace, power, and love. What's going on? It's your one and only Kansu Sheshbu Amun. And again, you've tuned in to another broadcast tonight with Team Osiris, man. We, we're trying to bring science to the public, man, in a way that everybody can understand it. Because our solution is definitely revealed in science. And tonight we're going to be talking about a phenomenon that um, has been discussed um, for so long. Um, every now and then it resurfaces. Um, I think naturally because of the need to discover who we are. Everybody wants to know who they are, where they come from, what started humanity, um, what race we are. These kind of things that we question and ask ourselves in regards to the human dynamic, um, the dynamics surrounding humanity. Why do we want so desperately to know who we are? I think it has a lot to do with cultural identity and that cultural identity gives us peace of mind, gives us a sense of belonging, a sense of being, because we create these norms in our minds as we are socially engineered to say who we are and who we are not. So adding to that paradigm with this phenomenon is the brother Hun Balam, a uh, member of Team Osiris, that is going to be speaking on uh, the phenomena of the um, ab Aboriginal people of North America. Who were they? Who populated them? Where did they come from? What was, what was the process? Um, <clears throat> did they just come from nowhere? Was it um, evolutionary? How did this process actually happen? So, Brother Hun, are you there? So, yes, I am. Yep. Okay, cool, man. Cool. So, um, yeah, I'm going to give you an opportunity, man, to kind of speak on this. And, um, uh, Give us light on this subject matter. And with that being said, brother, uh, with the rest of the Team Osiris members that are here tonight, I yield the floor to you, man. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I, I want to start off um, with a, a, a bit of uh, a background on uh, the human species as a whole. We, we understand who got to the Americas um, and when uh, and from where did they come from? Uh, because I think that uh, one of the, uh, a big question in a lot of the, you know, the, the so-called conscious community that, that has been there since the 60s is where did the white man come from? And, it, and uh, you know, from association, all other races where did the the did the mongoloid come from um and i think it is important uh to know the origins of man first and foremost before you can even ask such a question like that and to get to the point is evolution uh because if you cannot if you cannot even comprehend uh how humans homo sapiens how human beings came to be um in, in, in the beginning uh you know first and foremost and how are you going to understand how different morphologies different skull structures different skin colors and so on um it can, can even arise from so uh I, I wanted to start off with um with a, a bit of a slideshow uh one of the first slides that um, I, I wanted to, uh, to put out there was um, of the human or, or just the species uh, uh, evolutionary tree. Um, yeah, that's it right there. And, um, and before, before any complex organisms, before you even had a multi-celled organism, the, the foundation of all life is first and foremost um, the, the genes. The genes themselves act as if they are independent living creatures in and of themselves, without a body, without a cell to inhabit. Them in and of themselves act as living entities. And, um, you know, life, the definition of life in and of itself, it's, it's very broad. Uh, it, it, there is no consensus in uh, biology as to what constitutes life. But luckily, NASA had to do it for us because, you know, NASA is, is uh, interested in 
uh, space exploration and whatnot. And so one of the tests that they have at hand is how do we determine what is life out there? So they had to come up with some type of definition to at least uh, ground us, and they did. And, and, and they say that life is pretty much any chemical system that is self-sustaining and capable of Darwinian evolution. And so what does, what does that mean? Well, um, in biology, um, in, you have what it's called um, chemical evolution. And chemical evolution, before you get to biological ev evolution, uh, you know, uh, uh, on the level of, uh, of the genome and of cells and so on and so forth, you have just a basic, very general concept of repetitive production, you know. So th this, uh, this is the, 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 the earth moving around the sun, um, you know, uh, getting sunlight uh, for a certain amount throughout the day, then night falls, and all of that affects the different chemicals that are going on um, uh, on the earth, right? And at this time, we have to imagine an early earth without any complex organisms where it, it's just chemical uh, cycling through this process of repetitive production. Um, you have, uh, and, and one of those cycles uh, involved uh, the heating of certain minerals that, that, that produce, um, uh, that produced uh, elements like hydrogen, nitrogen, and carbon to unite together into uh, what you would call a fatty acid. Because the three main components of life are you need a fatty acid, which is what the cell walls are made up of. That, that, that's what holds uh, the nucleic acid in the, in the center of it, which is uh, a DNA, or, you could, or, or in the case of the... Uh, we'll be talking something a lot more primitive than DNA it would be something like RNA or something even simpler than that. But the, the bottom line is that you need a clayic acid instead of a fatty tissue. And the third component of life would be amino acids that the, that the, um, that the nucleic acid can, can uh, metabolize in order to make the cell wall and itself grow and eventually replicate. So, so, so uh, what I want to, to put emphasis on is the fact that once that, nu that nucleic acid does replicate, once it is formed through chemical evolution, the, the natural processes of the earth and so on and so forth, and once it is able to replicate, that, it is, that is the beginning of evolution. That, that is everything because no copy is ever perfect. It, 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 there, there are always mistakes in the genetic code, uh, in the RNA code or, you know, DNA or whatnot. And, and once those mistakes are made, uh, variation, um, it, variation comes about. Um, and and uh, if we can move on to the next slide, um, I, I, I want to, uh, I, it is an example of what happens when there is a, a, uh, a mutation on a genetic sequence. Uh, once that genetic sequence reproduces, it will pass on that, uh, that mutant onto its offspring and so on and so forth. And that offspring will eventually, in turn, once again, replicate with a mutation on the sequence. And um, that is important because once you do have that variation, like I said, uh, the, same, the same environment, immediate environment, can eliminate um, those versions of, it, of, of itself that are, that are just not up to par with, with, the, with the circumstances of the environment. And eventually, if you give it enough time, eventually you're going to have a, a new species that is completely divergent from its original form. And so the the genes are the foundation of it of that of that process and and the and the mutations that that um, uh, you know that, that result from from that replication process. So in the beginning, uh, in the major evolutionary transitions are genes to genomes. You know, uh, small strands of DNA into in, into an entire uh, I guess you could say soup of you could say soup of uh, of genetic code. And then once that, that, that genome is enclosed inside of a cell, 
uh, wall or, or the cell membrane, um, uh, you, you have a, a new type of organism. No longer is the gene just flowing by itself in water or in solution or however it may have been during the, the early earth. Of course, water was, was probably what it was in. Uh, but once you have that membrane, it creates a, a new type of organism. This is a new thing. And, and the, the most closest uh, related descendants that we can see around us today are, of course, bacteria and archaea. Uh, those are the simplest organisms that you can find, uh, possibly find um, in our world. So, um, so then the next step uh, to that, that type of single-celled organism is the fact that that type of single-celled organism doesn't have a nucleus necessarily. Uh, it, it doesn't have any in internal compartments with, if, you know, in which to specialize its function. So it's just... A, a fatty, you know, a, 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 a fatty acid that, that composes the, the cell wall and inside of it you have this just this noodle of, of DNA. Uh, but then in the next transition um, that, that we see in life, the more complex, uh, the uh, complex cell next to bacteria and archaea are protists, which are they, they, they are classified as eukaryotes, which simply just means that they have compartments inside of the cell. So they have a nucleus where the genome is, is enclosed in, and they have other small you know, types of organelles. They, they have a ribosome outside of the, uh, around the, uh, um, uh, around the um, uh, I forgot the, the terminology right now, but uh, um, they also have mitochondria. That's another compartment that it has inside of the cell. Um, and, and those are very important things because now it, it, this is a new organism, a new, a new type of organism. And, um, and these are, again, single cell organisms. They don't need to, to, uh, to um, uh, how do you say, to, to have a, a specialized relationship with each other. Uh, but when they do, they become so specialized that they can no longer survive on their own. So they, they live inside of a community of, of cells. It's a community of cells that before they used to be able to come in and out of that community without any problems. But over time, they depended on each other so much to, to survive that they became specialized in certain tasks, just like, um, you know, just like, uh, like, RN, like DNA became a specialized thing to hold information, whereas RNA could have done both things. RNA was able to not only store the information, but also uh, assist in its, in its own reproduction. Modern complex cells can no longer do that. Modern complex cells, the DNA depends on the RNA for the ribosome to be able to, to translate uh, the amino acids to form proteins. And, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so needless to say, once the, this community of, um, of, of cells come together and they become so specialized, they create a multi-celled organism. And um, the earliest, the most simple uh, multi-celled organisms that we have been able to, to see thus far are obviously uh, organisms under the sea, like mollusk-like creatures, um, you know, more plant, they look like they're more plants, although some qualify as animals, you know, according to the criteria that, that we have, uh, and so on and so forth. And again, these are organisms that are constantly replicating, which with every replication, with every offspring, there is a mutation, there is a, a, va a variation in that organism and then through time, natural selection acts upon it and eventually you get a, a, a product that ends up being a species that is completely divergent from its original version. And that's how you, you end up having uh, worms, uh, you know, fish, uh, uh, you end up having uh, amphibians, reptiles, and eventually you get mammals. Um, or, and, and, you know, back in, back in, 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 you know, we're talking 500 million years ago and, uh, 200 million years ago and so on and so forth. You always had some type of creature that resembled a creature that you would see today in modern day, but they weren't, you know, they, they weren't exactly full mammals, but they coexisted with 
uh, you know, reptile-like creatures and so on and so forth. But eventually, needless to say, they gave way to the species that you see today. Um, and if we could go to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, that uh, uh, that's just a representation of how, you know, when people ask, you know, if we came from monkeys, why are there still monkeys today? And uh, as you can see, it's not a linear thing. We didn't come from today's monkeys. We, we, we share in a common ancestor. Um, and it, it actually, we, you know, we share in a common ancestor first with ape, great apes, then eventually all great apes share a common ancestor with apes in general. Uh, and then before that, we we share a common ancestor with old world monkeys and apes and new world monkeys and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, as you can see, there's always dead ends in the evolutionary process. Uh, if we can move on to the next slide. Can we move on to the next slide? Um, yeah. Um, uh, the next one, we can move on to that one. And uh, uh, this is important because, um, you know, this is what lets us know that different species evolved from an ancestor because uh, although you can see it as clear right here because it's a bit small, but these are different layers of soil on the earth. So you always find certain creatures that are on a uh, on a certain layer of soil and the further you go back they that species eventually disappears but there's still a another species that resembles it but it's a lot simpler um and and and, and this is just one of the many um many uh pieces of evidence to evolution the fact the, the fact that you know if you look at uh at um at the pleistocene or or rather um the Triassic period, there's not going to be any fossils of rabbits, but there's going to be rodents-like fossils that you could see how modern rodents evolved out from. Hey, uh, brother, I, uh, mm -hmm. could I speak speak real quick? I think yeah, um, basically what you're describing is the definition of speciation. And Correct. Where uh, di you know, different species are. Uh, come about and they start diverging and becoming our own different species. And that's pretty much what happened with all life forms on this planet. Everything started from started from a single source and then everything started diverging and going under different pressures and different environments to become what it is today. And yeah, that's basically w what he's describing for the most part. That's all I wanted to say. Just want to make sure people understood that. Yeah, so um, so the this this slide that's coming up right now, uh, that that was exactly what I was trying to explain. It's just the the process of speciation, uh, but but I just wanted to give a little bit of insight into the the internal mechanics of what's going on. Like, uh, literally, it all revolves around that nucleic acid, you know, which in our modern lifetime. It is DNA. DNA is is the the modern nucleic acid that uh, that 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 is responsible for uh, the the variation of species every time that it copies itself, and there is mutations on on the genetic code. Um, so yeah, so so that, that that's the main thing that that uh, that I I wanted to emphasize on because that is how you create variants of any given species, and um, in the in this next slide, I, I don't know if you guys can see it. I'm not seeing it on the screen, but uh, but the uh, the the in the speciation process, uh, there's a reason why scientists give uh, very specific and precise names to um, to a species. Um, uh, it, yeah, it was the slide before this one. Actually, I'm sorry. Um, because in, in in the religious world, you, you have a, a, a lot of people that, you know, to this day, they're still asking, show them how, you know, how did a dinosaur turn into a, a bird or, or where are the, miss, where, you know, the, where is the missing link 
And uh, people need to know that that term missing link, it's an unscientific term. It's it, the missing link is basically a, a label into any transitional species or any transitional fossils ever that, that you ever find. So, you know, us right now, we are the missing link uh, between our ancestor, uh, our ancestral uh, hominins and whoever we will be in you know in 10,000 years from now or 20,000 years from now or 50,000 years from now whatever it may be uh we are that transitional species so concepts like birds and dinosaurs they're way too simplistic and as you can see on this chart is like you know you're trying to it, it, it is just there's species that are more bird like and species that are more reptile like or, or dinosaur like and there is no egg there's no line in nature. We are the ones that, that draw it, you know? Um, so in the, in the following slide, um, this is what G professional geologists and everybody, anybody that work that works as a professional in, in, in the field of, of geology and, 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 and analyzing the, the, the geography of the early earth and whatnot. Uh, this is the last supercontinent that formed um, in, in our, uh, you, you know, closer to, to our history. Uh, there, there was, I believe, one or two supercontinents prior to this one, but th this was the last one that formed out of plate tectonics and, and drift. And, uh, and as you can see, um, it, it, it took millions and millions of years to get to what we have today, to the geography that we have today. But the key one is the last before last, which is the, the Cretaceous period, which was around 60, by 65 million years ago, really 45, because 45 was when Antarctica split from uh, Australia, or rather Australia split from Antar Antarctica, however you want to look at it. But in either case, um, there was no Pangea 45 million, million years ago. And if you look at the next slide, um, this is why it is important because, um, because the primate species is, 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 you don't even see it until the death of those dinosaurs and the, the split of, of, of the continents, which is just common sense. I mean, in, in a world where the dinosaur was the alpha, where, where it was the only species that, that reigned for hundreds of millions of years, the only way mammals could survive is if they were small and puny and tiny and little critters and could, could, uh, you know, could hide away out of the way from these, these monsters, you know? So uh, it wasn't until their extinction, uh, which a little bit after their extinction, you know, the, the continents uh, completely uh, uh, at least uh, South America, uh, or rather the Americas and Africa split apart. Uh, it was after their extinction that you had new niche, niches to fill in. And these were filled in by rodent type creatures. So if you look at the earliest, uh, the, the, the primate today that is most closest to the ancestor of all primates, uh, these are uh, uh, pro prosemians and they're very, you know, they're small, small little monkeys. They're small apes, or, or rather, not apes, I'm sorry, but they're small um, primates. And, um, and you know, they, they, they're almost rodent-like, and then there's, they are still prosemians, uh, but they, they're actually, they start getting closer to monkeys. And then, you know, um, you see the, um, the, uh, the monkeys is the, is the next class that is closest to, what the common ancestor between all monkeys and apes would have looked like it would look something closer to a uh, to monkey than than an ape and then uh in the next slide um i believe um i, I there are some j just a few there's there's plenty of transitional fossils that you can look up online but this is just a a, a small few samples of the ones that they have found so for, for example uh, uh Egyptopithecus he looks like he might have been uh, already uh, an old, closer to old world monkeys than new world monkeys. But in either case, is 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 around that time frame when, you know, when uh, soon after their split, 
uh, because you know some monkeys were were stuck in um, in the Americas and some were stuck in Africa when the continent split. So it was the old world monkeys, however, that that split into a a, a from, that split from the apes at some point. And um, it, you know because uh, proconsul, the one that you see there around twenty million years ago or whatnot. Uh, he, he, his, uh, his, um, his anatomy is still very monkey-like with the, with the very important, um, the very important difference that he doesn't have a tail. So he, he, and, and Gibbons would be probably the closest species today, closest to him. But, uh, but, uh, Proconsul was a split, uh, you know, from, uh, from apes, uh, from the lesser apes. Which Gibbons are a part of, and then there's another ape that I can't recall right now, and then the great apes, which are orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, and finally human beings. So in the next slide, uh, we, we're going to zoom in on that that great ape timeline, and uh, as you can see, uh, humans split from a common ancestor with the chimpanzee around seven million years ago, seven to nine, give or take. And that was somebody that that was a hominin-like species, like um, like Sahelanthropus that they discovered uh, in North Africa, or Grecopithecus that they just recently discovered in Greece. Uh, and before that, the the other only closest cousin before the chimpanzees, the gorilla. So, so you think that obviously there there would have been a common ancestor that split at, at around the the eight million year mark and before that there there had to be a common ancestor for all great apes in general um and if we can move on to the next slide um uh, we're gonna zoom in on that seven million year split and that's where you have ape like creeks sahelanthropus or the pithecines and australopithecines or the most famous famous specimen was known as Lucy, um, but, but she was only, you know, 3.5 million years ago. Before that, she, she was preceded by um, Artipithecine scenes where uh, the most famous uh, specimen was dubbed Artie. Uh, but these are all, uh, you know, chimp-like, uh, ape-like creatures from uh, the bottom up, but, but, but uh, well, from the waist up, but they were already bipedally. You know, they, they at some point developed bipedalism, probably in a savannic environment um, near the Mediterranean or, or southern Europe. Um, uh, and, and then, um, be, be, and the reason why I say that is because Artipithecus, who, who was earlier than Australopithecus afarensis, um, he lived in a, in a woodland environment. And there's no, there's no, that means that that bipedalism, bipedalism had had to have already uh, evolved prior to him uh, living in, in that environment. Be, because before the discovery of Australopithecus, the theory was that Australopithecus, uh, which was found in a savanna-like environment, was the first to have roamed outside of that woodland environment, and she faced the savanna and developed bipedalism. But because Pithecus was discovered, we know for a fact he was in pure woodland environment, he had to be preceded by some, uh, you know, uh, another bipedal ape-like creature. And, you know, the discoveries lately, there's been three discoveries that have been in Southern Europe or, uh, around the Mediterranean. So uh, it, it kind of, point, and, and we know that that environment, uh, you know, um, nine, 10 million years ago was more savanna-like. So it, it, there's a strong possibility that it, it would have, uh, that the, the split between the chimpanzee and, and humans probably happened somewhere up there. And then Homo sapiens nonetheless eventually developed in Africa, North Africa or East Africa or somewhere around there. Um, so if we look at, at the next slide. <clears throat> uh, so along with that, you know, there, there, there is an obvious spectrum with the skull morphologies like uh, you know, the, these ape-like creatures that were walking bipedalism, nobody can really say that those are not like your typical apes, man. They, they are not chimpanzees. I mean, if you just look at their, 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 um, 
their pelvis is completely is closer to us than it is to other chimps. So, and then, you know, and that's followed by the, the continuum in, in the skull shape, which by the time you get to homo habilis, you already start seeing a, a, uh, a humanoid, human-like face and um and and his cranial capacity doubled you know from 300 to 400 uh cc to uh to 1700 or 1400 or, or, or whatever it was that um that it doubled to um and and uh it's never stopped since then um and, and then after homo habilis see even homo habilis you could still make the argument you know if you're a creationist or a religious type person you want to say oh that that's that's just a chimp but 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 okay, but the later versions of Homo habilis just start looking straight up humanoid, especially, you know, eventually when you get to Homo erectus uh, type species. And we have, you know, dozens of fossils of these. There's a lot of them. So, you know, if these are not humans, if you don't want to consider these people humans, they're definitely not apes. So, you know, that there's your missing link right there. They're, they're somewhere in between. Um, I don't know if any of you have anything to add to that, but. Uh, I, I hope this is making making sense. That's that's a great point. That's a, a great point, huh? For yeah. your religious types. Yeah. So, yep. And we can move on to the next slide. And this is important because uh, you know the the um, alternative origin theorists for for the arrival of the Americas they they rely on 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 doing away with speciation with the with the facts of speciation and evolution so on and so forth so th this is important to keep in mind when you're when you're thinking about the migrations from out of africa so um this in this picture right here we, we have the different where different remains have been found of what we officially consider hominids because they are closer to us than they are to other chimps even though the seven million or eight million year ones uh, you know that they're borderline. Like you know, you could you could you could classify them either way. But we know uh, based on tooth morphologies and and uh, uh, the study of of other bones that you know paleontologists. This is what they do for a living. That they they are able to analyze that criteria, and and they are saying that these are hominins. So uh, so you see, for millions of years, uh, from seven point two million years to about two million years. Uh, these were ape-like type creatures that are walk, walking bipedally, and uh, from ho Homo habilis on onwards, the cranial capacity just completely doubles, and and there's a lot more um, activity going on, um, uh, intellectual activity. Uh, you know, he he's definitely known for the tools, even though Australopithecus was using tools and eating meat, but that's uh, but, but not not as you know Homo habilis uh, is, is shows signs of um, of building, uh, carving out rocks at least, and and uh, and we know that the later versions of Homo habilis, uh, the the face just looks a lot more human, and so that's why by 1.5 million years ago you see Homo erectus uh, come about. So in the next slide, <clears throat> we see um, we see human have left Africa was not sapiens but Homo erectus uh, and and it was the dispersal of Homo erectus into different continents Asia and, and uh, Europe that gave way for speciation of the same species at that point to take place eventually right eventually Homo erectus or uh, Homo erectus descendants you know you're, you're getting into group you know gray areas right there but regardless we know that uh, that the Neanderthal um, came about from um, Heather Bregensis, Homo Heather Bregensis, which came from Homo erectus. Um, and and uh, in, in China, you see uh, right now, they just recently discovered a, a, a couple days ago uh, the Dali skull, or, or, or they didn't discover it, but they just, uh, they just released the conclusions on, on it that, um, you know, they're trying to say that it was. Uh, I mean, their, their wordplay there is, is kind of fuzzy right now because they they wanna they're saying that it was human, but you know, it, 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 there's there's no way that it could have been a sapien unless it was a hybrid. But that that would mean that you know that there had to be an earlier my Homo sapien migration out of Africa prior to us. But none of us today 
descended from that migration or directly from uh, a Denisovan or, or Neanderthal or Homo erectus. Like that, that's not us. If you look at the, and, and I'll go into this a, a bit later, but our genetic genetics doesn't support the multi-regional origins theory. There's no human alive today that you say, oh, he's a direct descendant of a Denisovan. You know, th these are just other hominins that, that the, uh, evolved from Homo erectus and other continents. And then when we spread out or when the successful uh, Homo sapien migration spread out, the one that was ultimately successful that led to each and every one of us, we met with them and we made it with them and we did, you know, we, we didn't mate with them, but, but that doesn't mean that, that uh, us as a species directly derived from an a Asian Homo erectus. So we look at the next slide. <clears throat> uh, this is the, well, Homo erectus was already out of Africa 1.5 plus million years ago. These are other hominins that were developing still in Africa or, or descendants of Homo, of African Homo erectus. So you have Homo helderbergensis. Uh, Naledi, I think the, the there's still a, a date discrepancy on Naledi, so I won't get into Naledi, but, th but these are other humanoid type species uh, that are being found all throughout Africa. And then eventually you get the one, uh, the 300,000 year old Jebel Erhout specimen, which um, is a Homo sapien based on, on uh, his, um, his skull morphology whatever criteria they, they have for that, because I know at that level they have to do some very in-depth analysis because the, the head size itself, it, you know, it, uh, even though it's still smaller than uh, a Neanderthal's, but, you know, uh, Jebel Erhard is, 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 a, is a great area, of, you know, he, you, know it, you, you could say, you could make the argument that he could have been some other species, uh, but, but nonetheless, it, it, it is a skull structure most similar, closer to us, than other archaic hominins that we have seen thus far. And so in the next slide, um, uh, well, th this is just uh, uh, some of the morphological continuity. Uh, you could scroll uh, through these. Um, here we have Australopithecus afarensis. Next is, um, is um, Homo habilis, if we could show that next slide. It, um, you get the, the earliest version of Homo habilis. Like I said, look, if you look at that face, uh, you could argue, you, even though he was bipedal, if you wanted to argue that he was, a, 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 that this, this species was a, a, an ape, some other ape, well, you can do that, but that face is already starting to morph, is starting to look more humanoid than it is, um, uh, you know, closer to other apes. And uh, we know that by this time, uh, this species had already lost most of the the body hair. There was a, at least um, a separation between like the pubic area and and the head. So um, so we'll, I'll get into that later. But if we look at the next version of Homo habilis, uh, this is a a late version of Homo habilis. By this time, he's already looking a lot closer to Homo erectus than he is to the earlier versions of Homo habilis. So next is Homo erectus, Homo erectus. Um, <clears throat> and here he starts looking closer to, you know, a, a Neanderthal based on his skull structure or, or, a, or Homo heather brigansis uh, or, or even us, you could say that he was closer, he looks closer to us than he would have Homo habilis or, you know, or, or, or even um, Lucy, you know. So if we look at the next slide, uh, this is a reconstruction uh, on the next slide of, um, of Jebel Erhard. Um, so th this is a, a reconstruction, uh, I forgot the, the artist's name, but this is a reconstruction of Jebel Erhard. And uh, th this, is a, this is a homo sapien, even though his head is big as hell, like that, that skull is huge compared to any of ours today, regardless of where you're from, that, that, that's, that's a very big skull. But, um, but you could you could already you you could identify with this uh, specimen more than you would of a Homo erectus as a human being, right? So, in the next um, it, now this is he's three hundred thousand years old. In the, in the next one, which is um, um, Hertoman, I believe, uh, from Ethiopia, um, he's 
a hundred and a hundred and sixty to one hundred and ninety no one hundred and sixty thousand years old so uh you know that that's a big gap between Jebel Erhoud and M and even closer to him now at this point than you know than Jebel Erhoud and um we can move on to the next slide um <clears throat> In the next slide um, is an example. Well, here is just a, a fact that we share uh, that, you know, cats and, and other felines share 95.7 or their DNA or some, something around that range. And nobody has a problem considering them uh, under the same, uh, you know, under the same family. You Nobody has a problem re relating them. But, uh, you know, somehow when, when it comes to humans and other primates, all hell breaks loose. So uh, in the next slide, um, and is actually, uh, th this is just some of the behaviors of our most, um, most closest cousin uh, that they have done multiple studies on, study after study after study. And you know, th there's a lot of behaviors in chimps that, that we share with them. I mean, they, they have hunting parties, you know, that's something that you, you would expect out of homo habilis or, or homo erectus, but for a chimp to be having hunting parties where they sneak through another community of chimps and silently, you know, trying to make the least noise as possible. And then once they get there, they, they just ambush them. Like that, that's pretty amazing that these creatures are walking around with us today doing similar. To, uh, you know. <clears throat> In the next slide, uh, if we can see the, the next slide. Uh, so uh, the, uh, yeah, you, you could scroll through these real fast. Th these are uh, Homo ergaster, which could be the same species as, as Homo erectus in Africa, or perhaps a, a split or whatnot. Here's another example of, of uh, Homo ergaster to a kind of boy that, that they found. He, he's the most complete specimen that they have found of Homo ergaster. Um, here are no, uh, Homo erectus, uh, uh, pecking man, I believe is what he's dubbed. Um, <clears throat> Homo erectus danamisi. I don't know too much about this particular specimen, but it, it just goes to show you that there's, they're all over the place. Um, <clears throat> uh, Homo heldebrigensis, which again, according to the criteria of the paleontologists who study the thing, um, you know, they, 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 they see certain characteristics in the skull structure that there is enough to differentiate him from uh, Homo erectus. So this is one version of him. Um, there should be another one coming up of uh, Homo heidelbergensis Roden rodensian man. Um, and then we, we can keep moving forward with other hominins. Homo antecessor, which this one is, is the little now because um, it, it could be that we are a lot closer as Homo sapiens to Homo antecessor, that we came from him directly, rather, or, or you know, somebody who descended from him, rather than from Heather Bergensis, which we know Heather Bergensis gave way to uh, the Neanderthal. So, uh, be, because if you look at that nose, um, you know, he, he has a way smaller nose than has been found in a lot of other, the, 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 in contrast to, to other archaic hominins. And we can move on to the next one. Uh, Floresiensis, uh, we don't know. There's got to be a gap. We don't know who he developed from, but he this one was found in Indonesia. He's a little tiny person that we went over there and slaughtered when we moved out of Africa. We can move on to the next one. Um, yeah, this is just um, uh, probably the, the uh, uh, th this was probably one of the anthrodols looked like during the early stages of their development just because we know for a fact that they had rickets which means that they had too much melanin to be surviving in in low uh, level sunlight environments like in europe so we know by the time he got to europe he was he had all types of, of problems so uh he was probably around the middle east or or Af probably more, most likely the middle east looking like this we can move on to the next one <clears throat> Just a female Homo neanderthalensis, and um, and I'll get into skin tones later. But th this is just to show you, that, 
it doesn't matter if you're homo sapien any any hominin species that that has exposed skin like that the further you move away from the equators uh eventually with enough time uh, uh Soikieta, uh an evolutionary biologist he says that it takes around 10 to 15,000 years for a completely different skin complexion to set in and of course within that time frame there's a gradual progression into that just because of the fact that you're moving away from the equator where the sunlight is not directly above you so you know it, it, it the sun doesn't discriminate it's just going to uh, and, and you know if you want to survive you you have to develop a lighter skin tone away from the equator unless you supplement it with vitamin d which is what the Inuit do but uh we, we can move on to the next one um and the next one after this these are just uh, child neanderthalensis reconstructions uh, the next one and then this is neanderthalensis in europe uh once you know he had fully evolved or you know, developed through natural selection to have lighter skin tones his skull morphology changed for some reason because apparently and i don't know the reason for this but apparently you know broad noses uh, are not uh, favored in 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 um art art this last last the later versions of neanderthals once it's well settled in, in europe for tens of thousands of years and as 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 it is obvious at this point his skin had already completely adapted to that type of environment as well as his facial features uh the the nose is still uh, well in size it is big relative to uh, homo sapiens in general but uh but it's not as broad um again due, due to the environment and and i think heru here can elaborate on a, a little bit on, on why um the equator and tropical uh, regions tend to to favor broad noses okay well yeah when it comes to uh tropical environments you end up with broad noses only because your body is uh it, it's allowing your body to cool off a lot better that's why you have bigger noses and broad you know broader nostrils so you can get more air intake in to uh cool your body off then once you start moving towards the more colder regions the arctic regions the antarctic regions your, your nose tends to get smaller because then you want to uh, limit <clears throat> the air you're breathing in um based on the uh temperature so that's mm. part of the reason why nose nose noses vary throughout the world it just depends on the environment you know that uh your particular line uh uh, uh should i say uh evolved in right okay if uh we can move on to the next one um we've um here is where we we have the the present day 2017 um uh, skull morphologies uh from a sam bushman a yoruba west african a papuan from um new guinea a chinese a northeast asian han chinese man and a french person from from europe and uh and and, and this is where there is a gap that I feel is it definitely needs to be addressed because in the same way that you saw a continuum and a spectrum and a progression in the, the, the morphology of those early hominids into Homo sapien, there is going to be another morphological change and, and other morphological changes once a tropical man from from africa leaves homo sapien man leaves out of africa and encounters these new environments just like homo erectus did when he left so is nature doing the same thing twice and and what what i'm going to try to do in in these next slides is try to fill in those gaps between okay uh the homo sapien somebody like uh uh like uh jebel Earhart or, or better yet uh Herto man could have developed all of these different morphologies because even the sun uh, is a different morphology from Hertoman, and so are West Africans, and so are every modern human today. It, it's a, a you know it is a different morphology from Hertoman, and I'll show you why in the next slides. So 
So he, here's our progression out of Africa. This is not even using genetics. This is why, why it's so sad when, when people are still denying out of Africa um, in, in 2017, because not, this, you could just consider this archaeology alone. This is just from the finding of fossils, from the finding of, 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 of evidence for a human presence, like, like uh, you know, fires or, or tools that that are consistent with uh those that homo sapiens made and whatnot and um and so this is just the archaeology alone so so it says a lot when genetics also also overlaps with the archaeological findings so as you can see here uh no other continent has been able to produce a homo sapiens specimen that is older than hurtle man even let alone jebel Earhout. You know, so that just tells you that the, the oldest uh, Homo sapiens developed in Africa from earlier from earlier hominin species, um, and then eventually we made our way out of Africa. And um, you know, uh, South Asia was first around um, eighty to sixty-five. Well, they they say in Australia the the most recent findings are saying that that Homo sapiens arrived in Australia anywhere from eighty to sixty-five thousand years ago. So obviously, uh, the ancestors of of um, of Australians had to leave from the Arabian Peninsula somewhere between one hundred and twenty-five to one hundred thousand years ago in order to to nomad hunter gather their way into Australia, but. Uh, but yeah, we can move on to the next slide, and and that's just again remember that's just archaeology alone. Now this is the genetic map, um, which which um, <clears throat> measures mutations that every human being has on top of a sequence whose earliest version we today we find in the Bangwa of Cameroon, um, or more popular people still. still usually use the the Sam Bushman as the um as the example uh, of of the of the humans that have the earliest uh genetic sequence but in reality if you compare the genetic sequence of of the Sam Bushman to the Bangwa or the Mbo from Cameroon you will see that uh, that the San end up having basically mutations on top of the the Mbo or the Bangwas sequence and, and that was discovered because of Perry's Y, which was a North Carolina African American man um, whose descendants through a a commercial DNA testing company, just like if you were 23 andme or National Geographic, it was because they opted in for a, a commercial DNA test that their their uh, Y chromosome sequence was discovered. And then uh, of course, you look. You, we, you know, you look to Africa for who and what population in Africa shares this sequence, and the Mbo and the and the Bangwa were the ones that that came about. Uh, but this, uh, but this one is actually th this haplomap right here that you see here. This genetic map, it, it's um, it, it's actually of just empty DNA, which is separate from Y DNA, which we can see next in the next slide, and. Um, and so again, you have uh, two separate uh, genomes, you know, because your mitochondria uh, uh, DNA is stored in your mitochondria cells, with, with, or, or rather in your mitochondria, which is uh, separate from the nucleus. And these are two different uh, parts of, 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 of your cell with two different, completely different genomes. And what a coincidence that they both back to African sequences. So that just goes to tell you that the archaeology supports out of Africa and the genetic mutations that we have in our genome from both the paternal line and the maternal line support out of Africa. And then uh, we can move on to the next slide. Uh, these are just mutations that different human populations acquired through moving out of Africa. Um, uh, you know, anywhere from lactose tolerance to a an adaptation to a, a marine diet, uh, malaria, of course, uh, cholera resistance, um, adaptations to our scenic rich environments, cold climates, and so on and so forth. And, and these are things that you can see in modern populations today that for you to say that you were the original inhabitants of any given region, well, uh, you would have to ask yourself why you don't have 
the adaptations that today's modern peoples acquired through thousands of years of staying in those given regions. Um, so yeah, we can move on to the next next slide. Um, this is just a follow genetic tree of the same, just the same thing that we saw in the in the auto of, uh, in the auto Africa uh, haplo maps. This is just uh, another way of looking at it. Uh, as you can see, all the way to the top left hand corner, you have genetic sequence A00, and that that's what's found amongst the Mbo and the the Bangwa, and uh, the the Khoisan. I believe they are A1. Uh, A1A, I believe, uh, and then you have other Nilo-Saharans are A3, uh, followed by the Pygmies, which are B, um, and then you have um, a split from CT, which was the the ancestors to everybody uh, that's outside of, uh, and um, uh, um, a few populations uh, that that CT marker they went extinct but it was found against the natu uh, i mean amongst the natufian culture and a couple other cultures of the near east um and and it split into de and cf and uh, and c is found mostly uh, amongst asians uh, the australians are c and d um d is found amongst the andaman Andamanese Islanders, and E is uh, what covers most of Africa with uh, Afro-Asiatic speakers, um, um, uh, Berber speakers, Cushitic speakers, uh, Bantu speakers, and Niger-Congo speakers. So we can move on to the next slide. Uh, again, this is just some of the, the genetic demographics of Africa. Um, basically, what, what I had just said right now, you have different populations, different genetic uh, mutations on their chromosomes, and we have been able to track um, their, their expansions throughout the continent because of so. We can move on to the next one. Next slide. Um, again, this is Hertel Man. So uh, this is just to reiterate that he came out of Africa uh, or, or, or you know, yeah, humans, you know, 50 or 100,000 years ago, 80,000 years ago, leaving Africa, they would have had features like him. As you can see he has a very thick bridge, bow ridge, which can today can only be seen in South Asian populations like Australians and Papuans. Nobody, nobody else uh, maintained that um, because of adaptation, of course. So if we could look at the, at the next one. Um, <clears throat> The next slide shows a uh, Kifian man, I believe. Uh, th this is the ancestor to West Africans. Um, he, 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 his population lived around the, the Sahel. Now, this specimen is actually relatively young. He, he's only 10,000 years old, give or take. Uh, but, but this is just an example of, you know, after Hertoman, uh, uh, Hertoman homo, type homo sapiens were still roaming Africa. Eventually they lose the brow ridge. They no longer have the brow ridge. They, they are evolving. They are adapting to, to new environments and, and whatnot. Or, or, and also genetic drift has a, a big part to play in that when, when populations keep intermixing with one another, uh, natural selection favors certain kinds. Uh, these are, you know, uh, the, the West African type that mixed in uh, with pygmies and, and whatever hunter-gatherer populations were uh, in West Africa prior to um, the Kiffian man's uh, type having gone, uh, having mutated there. Um, we can move on to the next slide. Um, uh, the, the pygmies, whoever their ancestors were, obviously came into these jungle regions and and um, similarly to what happens in islands where specimens shrink, um, species shrink uh, when, when they're in islands, um, some type of, of, uh, of natural selective process had to select for their small stature because I, I think they're only, what, like four, four feet tall, four or five, something like that. Um, we can move on to the next slide. 
um, again, nor North Africans and East Africans shared a Caucasoid. This uh, this is actually labeled wrong, I would say, because you know they, they share um, they have a Caucasoid morphology, uh, which just means you know thin facial features and and other criteria that the crani cranial metrics look at. Um, I wouldn't say it's Caucasian phenotypes because if anything, I, I would think that the that the Caucasian derived them from African uh, populations or, or po a population that, that left Africa and eventually developed them there there in in um in Europe as well. <clears throat> so we can move on to the next one. Uh, these are Maasai people who already you can see like a proto. East African Caucasoid uh, features in them, and we can look at the at the next slide after this, which should be Cushitic peoples. Um, yeah, so th this is what you see today in 2017. So, uh, so th this was basically just to show that as Homo sapiens is moved throughout Africa, he is also developing different different features this is just what 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 happens you know throughout tens of thousands of years um in between and we could look at to the next slide we're going to move on to oh, okay well south A south africans can't forget about uh the khoisan and and their uh their clades um moving on to the next slide <clears throat> As uh, Homo sapiens started moving, um, uh, well, I, I'll touch on South Asia later because uh, because this migration actually took place after, you know, after humans had already reached South Asia. But these are Aboriginal um, Europeans, and what I want, and as you can see, they they have a lot of, uh, especially the two men have uh, the the thick brow ridge, uh, and if you look at a at a reconstruction. In, in full detail of these specimens, you will see that they definitely look more australoid than they would look uh, like any other humans. And then the bottom two, you could already start seeing how that 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 Caucasoid morphology is is will eventually develop. But these are Aboriginal Europeans from thirty five thousand years ago. And if we can move on to the next slide by. Uh, by 25,000, definitely 20,000 for sure, you already had these type of features. Uh, maybe a little bit more robust than the Middle Eastern man, but, you know, give or take, this is a, a classic Caucasoid morphology, regardless of their skin color. So, uh, be, because at this time, we know that they were still, uh, are, you know, at least darker than, than pale. And uh, because the PEL mutation, uh, the SLC24A5 and SLC2A5, I believe, uh, the, those two SLC uh, gene mutations uh, only developed around 10 to 8,000 years ago. Uh, but regardless of that, they already had every other genotype, every other biological makeup that makes them who they are today. You know, it, it, one mutation is not going to define <laughs> their, their entire being. As a whole, so we can move on to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah, uh, here you can see how Northern Europeans share more hunter-gatherer DNA from those um, from those Aboriginal Europeans than than, so than Southern Europeans who share more DNA with the Middle Eastern uh, farmers who came into Europe around 10,000 BCE. And then we can move on to the yeah. So here we're we're gonna look at the morphology again. All, all, the following examples they don't necessarily share the same uh, the same genetic lineage, uh, nor necessarily a direct descendant from um, like so, so. For example, the the Dravidians are not a direct descendant from the Aboriginal Indians, South Indians that were that were. That, that were there, but but uh, it, it's an example of the morphology that developed as humans were coming out of India, which can still be seen in some Indians. We'll, we'll get to the um, 
next. So this is the map of India. Um, the, the aboriginals of India, a lot of people think is the Dravidians, but it's really not. The Dravidians came even later after um, the Sri Lankans. So we're going to look at the next slide. It's um, uh, a couple of Sri Lankan people. Um, these people are called the Veda. And uh, as you can see, you, you, you can see uh, some, some traits that they, that they share with Australians. Um, most of, and, and those archaic humans, uh, which is the, the, the thick brow ridge uh, that they still preserve. And, um, and, you know, whereas the Dravidians, uh, the, you do have some Dravidians that, that, are, that look more of, of, of like an in-between. But uh, once you get to the Tamils and, and a lot of other Indians, they are a lot more Caucasoid and, the, and with narrow features. And that's not necessarily because of the admixture that came even later uh, from the Indo- uh, the Indo-Europeans uh, is just that, uh, or the Indo-Iranians, I should say, uh, is just that, that this, uh, they are different lineages, but nonetheless, the people like these were the ones that were migrating out of Africa. They had thick brow ridges, and they looked a lot closer to asteroids than they would of any other human being alive today. Um, so we can move on to the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> you see the, this other example in the next slide of um of of other um sri lankan people uh, south south indians aboriginal south indians um again they, they, these are called veda people uh and, and you know they split into other you know sub ethnic sub ethnic groups but in general uh there was a time when in the 1800s they were even uh, called v, the Vidoid race, which, you know, it, it, it's really just a, another way to say Australoid outside of, a, um, of um, Australia and, and Papua New Guinea. So we can move on to the next one. Um, <clears throat> uh, again, these are Tamil people, Dravidian, or other, other Dravidian type people. Uh, you know, again, uh, they are a lot, they have a lot more narrow features than those aboriginals. Then we can move on to the next one. Um, <clears throat> uh, here we, uh, we have the migration e e eventually from South India down the coastline into Australia back, uh, back when there was still a land bridge there before the, the, the end of the last ice age 10,000 years ago where the, the sea levels rose and it flooded uh, it, is, it flooded that that uh, bridge that was known as Sundaland in the same way that it flooded the Bering Strait in uh, in Siberia and North America, and in the same way that it flooded Dogerland in uh, Europe. So um, the migration into Australia took place uh, here. It says forty thousand years ago, but again, the latest findings suggest sixty-five to eighty thousand years ago, even. Uh, probably, you know, uh, probably um, it, it must have been a, a smaller wave and then more humans came in. But that was the migration into uh, Melanesia, into Australia and Melanesia. Now, a lot of people, and, and this is important because a lot of people confuse the, uh, they, 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 they think that the aboriginals were all throughout Southeast Asia but they were not. They, they did not inhabit Polynesia until the Austronesians came down from Taiwan around starting from 3,000 years ago. So starting around 3,000 years ago, uh, uh, Austronesian people, uh, nothing to do with Aust uh, uh, Australia. Uh, I think uh, is simply because Austro means south. So, you know, they, they were Southeast Asians, but they were closer to Northeast, North Asians than they were to Australians. And they came down from Taiwan around 3,000 years ago, and they were the first inhabitants of Polynesia uh, as a whole, you know, all, all those Polynesian islands, because uh, they were completely uninhabited, um, including Micronesia, although maybe at the outskirts of Melanesia, you know, the, the Papuans, might, they might have inhabited uh, small uh, islands at the outskirts close to 
close to uh, Polynesia and close to Micronesia, but overall, for the most part, they were uninhabited. Um, <clears throat> so, and, and, and we also know this because the skeletons from the Lapita culture, with, which dates around 1500 BC, BCE, I believe, uh, in Polynesia, uh, those skeletons, DNA was extracted from them and there was no presence of, uh, of Melanesians or Aust Australians obviously. So uh, they, they were completely Austronesians. They came down from Taiwan. So if we can look at the next slide, it's just an overview between all the different nomenclature of South Asia. You know, there's a lot of Asias, but, you know, um, but, but it's, it's not that hard to remember once you visualize, visualize it this way. Uh, you have obviously the, the tip of Southeast Asia, uh, which includes uh, Indonesia is still considered a part of Asia, uh, but uh, Australia and New Zealand, uh, some dub it Australasia, Melanesia obviously is, includes Papua New Guinea and the surrounding nearby islands. And then the islands further from Melanesia, that those are all Polynesia and Micronesia is north of Melanesia. Uh, now, New Zealand, though, it, it's it's sometimes considered part of Polynesia, just because the Austronesians were also the first to inhabit New Zealand just um, um, a couple thousand years ago. Uh, and then Austronesia is considered all the, the, the whole spread of the Austronesians, they came down from Taiwan. So they colonized, obviously, all, all of Polynesia, and they made their way uh, through Wallasia. Uh, or Wallachia, or no, Wallachia, I, I believe it, it's called, which is uh, the, the islands in between Australia and, and the Philippines and, and so on. Uh, and they reached all the way up down even to Madagascar near, near Africa. So, so that, that's because they had all the seafaring technology. Um, if we can move on to the next slide. Uh, it zooms in on the Polynesian Triangle. Again, they came down from Taiwan around 3000 BCE and they started filling each of these islands, uh, eventually filling up the, 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 the three biggest islands in Polynesia, um, or the, the, the furthermost islands, which are Hawaii, New Zealand, and Rapa Nui. And then in the next slide, you see some of the aboriginals of South Asia, uh, of Malaysia, which, which are, are the Samang, uh, the Jarawai, and the Andamanese and Islands, uh, the Mani people of Thailand, and the Aera people of the Philippines. Um, those were peoples that were there before the Austronesians came down, um, which is what we're gonna show in the next slide. Uh, these are Austronesian speakers. Um, Again, um, and, and even in the next slide, if we can see that one, you can see a little bit better how they resemble mostly Filipinos today. Um, even though f uh, a lot of Filipinos are, are even more admixed just because of of uh, colonial history and even before them. But, uh, but, but these are Nicobar Islander people, which is an island just, just right next to, um, right next to the Andamanese Islands. And again, th these were, it, it wasn't inhabited until the Austronesians came down. And we can move on to the next one. Um, <clears throat> these are the uh, Samoan people and Tonga people resemble them as well. Um, it, it still baffles me how short Austronesian people can evolve into gigantic Samoan type people, but uh, but it happened. That's that's uh, they are Austronesians. That they share the same DNA. Uh, so these are the uh, or the indigenous people of Polynesia that inhabited New Zealand, like the Maori people, um, and um, and Hawaii, of course, and probably Rapa Nui, um, and the rest of Polynesia. So uh, the, the, these this is these are the demographics of South Asia, and it's important because in our next, the next part of, of uh, the, ne the next part of this uh, talk, we, we will be talking about the indigenous people of the Americas, um, and we'll get to that next, but first I wanted to emphasize 
the importance of knowing the demographics of Southeast Asia because uh, as you can see in this map, that South Pacific route, it's inconceivable. There, there were no Polynesians, uh, there, there were no humans in Polynesia up until 3000 BCE. Uh, you know, somebody would have to show skeletons to prove that there were, but that there were any. And so as a, a direct transoceanic route would be mind boggling. It is completely inconceivable, especially without boat technology during the Paleolithic era. So, um, so yeah, so uh, I, I hope that that gives you a, a good idea of, of the demographics of Paleolithic, Europe, Paleolithic, South Asia. Uh, I didn't really touch on Northeast Asia because it ties into North America. So we'll leave that up for the next uh, episode. But so far, th th this is the, the continuity in morphology um, that you see during the Paleolithic era and how it evolves into 2017 human beings. Anybody got anything to add to that? No, man, I just say you going in, man, and to all the listeners out there, pay attention, man, and, and research these things so you can know, you know, what it is that you're talking about. Because there's, of course, a lot of different, you know, theories and hypotheses get thrown around and strewn about you know, online and also just in our everyday lives. So it was good to just get some grounding, you know, where you can compare and cross-reference from different fields of study to come to a good, you know, conclusion. So that's all right. I want to say about that. Yeah, yeah, no doubt, definitely. Yes, yeah, so with that said, I think uh, unless anybody has anything else to add, um, I think uh, that will wrap it up for tonight. Yeah, yeah, I definitely want to add that to that. Yeah, that yeah me too, brother. Go ahead, man. Yeah, that was an excellent presentation. I mean, that's that's pretty much a good foundation. Stand on what you're talking about people, a certain amount of people. So this is pretty good. Um, almost I a little bit as far as what we're doing on the uh, the Russians project, how we started from the beginning, and it worked that way towards the current present time. That was really good foundation of work. I was really uh, impressed by the earlier part of this, the presentation. We started you know, showcasing the disease, started getting into the evolution of how humans became human. I think a lot of people omit that yeah. in the process. You know, not, not even just evolution, but just upon how we came to be. So they think, okay, you have sex cells, procreate mom and dad, and boom, baby's born. They omit the history of how that came. So I think that's very, very crucial when it comes to understanding your people. You know, so a lot of people, if they don't understand genetics. I'm pretty sure you can understand after watching that part how humans can be. Very crucial thing. Yeah, definitely, man. You know, it's, um, you know, evolution, understanding, understanding evolution is really understanding terminology. Uh, that's the most important thing. And that's what gets lost in the discussion. You know, it's a little bit of truth in creation and evolution. It's really not just one total um, one sided type of perspective. So it, it's, it's good that you um, kind of disambiguated some things and put things in better perspective because terminology is probably the most important factor in history, research, and understanding science. Because scientific language is not layman's language. That can always create a different type of psychological perception when you're assimilating and dissimilating information. So yeah, hon, um, <clears throat> you know, that's good work, man. And you know, we got, we got another you know, part two to this that's gonna be um, as equally uh, informational. But that's what's up, bro. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Yep. Absolutely. So if you are um if you are done, uh or you have something to close out with before part two, because uh, you know, we're gonna impart on some things beyond that. But um 
Are you done? Yeah, but... no, that, that's basically it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I would just um, uh, advise the, the viewers to uh, to stay tuned for the next episode. So, All right. That's, well, that's what it is. That's what it is, bro. Much appreciated. Appreciate the panel of Team Osiris members. Brother Melva Jefferson, the brother Tristan Turner, the brother, the form, the artist formerly known as Haru, brother Herbert, <laughs> uh, of course, our presenter, brother Han Balam. Thank you so much, man. Um, uh, we really yeah. appreciate uh, what you've done. Much, a bunch appreciated, bro. Um, peace to brother Higgs Bozon, who was on earlier. Thank you, brother, for attending. Uh, brother uh, Hero, thank you. Shout out to brother. Uh, Gacy and Gozi, a.k.a. Amir Kamara, who is the founder of Team Osiris. Shout out to Brother Kufu, co-founder of Team Osiris. Shout out to Brother Geechee Gullah, Jack, another member of Team Osiris. Shout out to Brother Joshua Kane, who was on earlier as well, who recently did a great show. Um, shout out to uh, all the brothers that I may have forgotten, man. Brother Ahmed, shout out to you. Brother Waza, shout out to you, man. Um, and all the other Team Osiris members, uh, thank you so much. If I forgot you, man, just check, you know, hold me, hold it to my heart, man. I, I didn't try to try to do that. But until next time, man, peace and power, y'all.